start a new recording for section 1.3. I, well, it, this time for real 1.3. And 1.3 is trigonometry. And it's kind of surprising how a little will actually use trig in our calculus one. I mean, the real difference between the main line calculus course and like applied calculus is that main line calculus assumes you've seen trig before, applied calculus doesn't have any trigonometry. And you'd kind of think if that's the big difference between them, then trigonometry must be a big deal in math 151. It really isn't. We're going to briefly review the unit circle definitions of the sine and the cosine. We're going to make sure that your calculators are all in radian mode and stay there for the rest of the course. And we're going to do a little right triangle trigonometry. So let's start. Well, Let's start by reminding everyone what radians are. Radians like degrees are a way to measure angles. If you're measuring angles in degrees, a straight line is 180 degrees, and a circle is 360 degrees. If you're working in radians, a straight line is pi radians, and a circle is two pi radians. So just another way of measuring angles, but um, but count to this needs to be done if you're working with the trig functions, you need to be working with radians. Um, because remember that calculus, well, you, I mentioned this, I don't know if you'd remember it, but calculus is the study of change and how fast an angle is changing depends on how you measure it. If you're measuring in degrees, then we go from zero to 360, just like that. If you're measuring in radians, then not this isn't even close to 360. It's two pi, six point something. So the um, sort of stuff we learn in this class that's related to trigonometry simply doesn't work if you're measuring your angle in degrees. It needs to be radians. And I mean, the real, when you first see radians, it's probably like, what the heck? The, the real point of measuring angles this way is that it gives us a very nice calculus. If we were measuring angles in degrees, we'd have a bunch of weird constants floating around all the time. So the real secret to radians is that they make calculus nice to do. 
And let me, so your cultivator will be in radians by default. So if you never switch to degrees, there isn't anything you should need to do, but let's be careful. So here's our cultivator, here's a screen. Near the top of the cultivator, there's a mode button. And you'll press the mode button and you'll see a big list of stuff. And one of the things you'll see, you'll see maybe it won't be written out, maybe it will be a rad and deg or something like that, but you'll see, stop that, thank you. You'll see um, radians and degrees sitting next to each other in this menu. And you just want to make sure that radians is highlighted instead of degrees. And if it isn't, you use the arrow keys to scroll down to it and you press the, and, and you highlight radians and you press the enter key. And that will change you to radian mode. And there's a problem on one of the quizzes that's We'll just quickly test, take a sign. We'll determine if you're in radian mode or not based on whether you get the right answer. So we'll just double check that in the quizzes. Okay, so let's remind ourselves very briefly what the sine and the cosine are. You could probably possibly get away with just not doing this, but it is, it is a pretty foundational definition. The sine and the cosine are defined in a very odd way, or at least it certainly must seem odd the first time you see it, I think. We start by creating a unit circle, by which I mean that it's centered at the origin, and has a radius of one. And you have some angle theta. This angle is used to define two quantities more than two quantities, but let's talk about two for now. The sine of theta and the cosine of theta. And I say the exact reason we define things this way, it might seem kind of foreign, but the sine of theta is this vertical distance. The cosine of theta is this horizontal distance. Another way of interpreting that would be that this point is the cosine theta comma the sine of theta. You might have seen it defined like that as the x and y coordinates of a point instead of a distance. It comes out to the same thing. And as I say, that definition is kind of like, what the heck? But the reason the sine and the cosine are so important 
is that the sine and the cosine have graphs that look like waves. And, you know, a lot of real world situations oscillate back and forth. You look at the temperature over the day. It's cooler in the early morning, gets hot in the noon, then gets cooler in the evening. So the temperature is doing something like this. So putting aside this kind of weird definition, the real reason we care about the sine and the cosine is that it lets us do math with those wave functions. Whether it's the temperature or the tide or the revenue of a seasonal business or anything like that that goes up and down, we use the sine and the cosine to study those. Let's define the rest of the trig functions. You must have seen these in either pre-calculus or trigonometry, but um, in high school, you, uh, I think, often just get presented with three of them, the sine, the cosine, and then something called the tangent. So let's remark, we, uh, let's, uh, Refresh. Let's refresh our memory of the tangent. The tangent is not, not going to be defined in terms of the unit circle. Now that we've defined, at least not directly, now that we've defined the sine and the cosine, the tangent is going to be defined in terms of those. The tangent is going to be the sine divided by the cosine. The graph of the tangent, I could. I was going to say I could go to Desmos and create a nicer graph, but it's not a big deal. The graph of the tangent is less clearly applicable than the graph of the sines and the cosines, but they look like this. They have a bunch of vertical asymptotes where the function isn't defined, and then between them, these curves. Why do we have these vertical asymptotes where the function isn't defined? Well, because we're dividing by the cosine, and the this is the sine, but the cosine keeps being zero and we can't divide by zero. So everywhere the cosine is zero, the tangent isn't defined. So, that's what all of these vertical asymptotes are about. And then there are three other trig functions. And I think, um, I think in trigonometry or pre-calculus, you kind of get the idea that the sine, the cosine, the tangent are the ones that matter. And then there are these other functions that we define for the heck of it, I guess. Um, in calculus, the secant is actually extremely important. So let's remind ourselves what the secant is. <coughs> it's one divided 
by the cosine. And the secant is going to inherit its importance from the tangent. If you have a tangent and you start doing calculus, secants are going to start showing up. And we'll see that later when we learn how to actually do a count to this with trig functions. But the secant is important. The secant is sometimes, in fact, the third most important trig function. Like we're not going to see this in this course, really, but in math 252, there are going to be situations where we have the sine, the tangent, and the secant, and we don't care about the cosine. So the secant, at least, you should nail down. Now, I guess honesty compels me to admit the remaining two trig functions genuinely aren't that interesting. We're going to do very little with the cotangent and the cosecant in this course, but just, I guess, for completeness's sake, we can remind ourselves that the cosecant is one divided by the sine. And you have to be careful with this because the names are maybe a little misleading. You think co, cosine, but it's the secant that's defined in terms of the cosine. The cosecant is defined in terms of the sine. They don't match up in the way you might expect them to. And then the cotangent. Again, these, these definitions are never quite what it seems like they should be. The cotangent is one divided by the tangent, and that's different from the cosine or the cosecant, right? The cosine is not one divided by the sine. The cosecant is not one divided by the secant. The cotangent is one divided by the tangent. So it's easy to sort of make mistakes here if you get a little careless. Um, an alternative definition of the cotangent, it's the reciprocal of the tangent. So instead of the sine over the cosine, it's the cosine over the sine. And we'll, as I say, at least work fairly frequently with four of these, with the sine, cosine, tangent, and secant. Maybe less so with these two. Those are the definitions. I Once again, I, I, I warned you yesterday, we might use more of this extended class period. I'm going to push through and finish 1.3. We're pretty close to the end. Um, I'm once again feeling the lack of this calculator emulation software, because there's a very natural question that students um, sometimes end up having to ask, which is suppose that you want to evaluate the secant of a number. Suppose you want the secant of point 
five. Well, you go to your calculator and what you realize is that there's a sine button and a cosine button and a tangent button, but there isn't any secant button. So to evaluate the secant of a number, you use the definition of the secant. That the secant of 0.5 is one divided by the cosine of 0.5. So if you need the secant or the cotangent or the cosecant, you just have to use that definition. Likewise, if you're trying to graph the secant, there's no secant button that you press. You just have to graph one divided by the cosine. So that's something to be aware of. I don't want to dwell on right triangle trigonometry because we're not going to use it in earnest until calculus two. And by the time we're in calculus two, we'll probably have forgotten everything that we do today. But I'll just briefly remind everyone that if you have a right triangle and an angle on that right triangle, we can use the trigonometric functions to study the triangle. If we call that the side opposite the angle. If we, I mean, if we're standing at the angle and looking this way, this would be the opposite wall, hence the name. And we call that the adjacent side. Once again, if I'm standing here, the adjacent side is the one that's next to me, it's adjacent. And this then is the hypotenuse of the right triangle. Then the sine of theta is the length of the opposite side over the length of the hypotenuse. The cosine of theta is the adjacent side over the hypotenuse, the tangent of theta is the opposite side over the adjacent side. Um, the memory aid, I think, that is most commonly used is to imagine an old Indian chief named Soka Toa. I sometimes worry that that is perhaps a little racist. So I try to steer away from that. The one that I learned in like high school geometry, some old horse catch another horse, take oats away. I may say that decades after taking high school geometry, my older brother, who picked the college he went to exclusively on whether he could not take any math courses there, still remembered some old horse, catch another horse, take oats away. The only part of his high school geometry class that appears to have made an impact. Um, what about the other trig functions? Well, there's no clever memory aid for those, but 
but for example, the secant is the reciprocal of the cosine. So the reciprocal of the cosine is the hypotenuse over the adjacent. So no clever memory aid, but if you remember sine, cosine, and tangent, you can figure the others out if you need them. And that we're almost done. Just five or ten more minutes. We'll get out of here on time. Does anybody have any questions? I should ask. So if you got here like through a trigonometry course or maybe pre-calculus courses do this too. You at one point or another probably had a bunch of trigonometric identities wasted off on you. And if you're like me, you have since forgotten every one of those identities. Um, that's fine. We're going to use very little of that in this course. In calculus one, there's just one thing you should have at your fingertips, and that's the Pythagorean identity. This shows up just enough in calculus that it's worth memorizing. All of that other stuff you might have learned, like the half angle form to those and the double angle form to those, I never memorize that. I just look it up if I need it. But the Pythagorean identity, which says that the sine squared of theta plus the cosine squared of theta equals one, that you should know and be able to use. Um, this is the, called the Pythagorean identity. If, if we scroll back a few frames, it's, it comes directly from the Pythagorean theorem. Here's a right triangle. The legs are the sine and the cosine. This is a unit circle, so the hypotenuse is a radius, it's one. And this is then just the Pythagorean theorem that the cosine squared plus the sine squared equals one squared. Of course, one squared is one. So, I mean, we won't be using this every day, but it's good to know, especially if you're going to take out to this too with me. This does show up fairly frequently in some sections of count to this too. And I believe that that will take us to the end. So just a few, I mean, congratulations. I know you have Friday classes and stuff, but from my point of view, you've made it through the first week of class. Um, there are quizzes due. I do want to warn you, or not warn so much as inform you. Um, the quizzes are due Saturday evening. I do. I do have, I mean, I have a life. I am a student myself. I'm taking classes. I'm not constantly checking my work email over the weekend. 
And that means that if you wait until Saturday and you suddenly discover that you can't do the quizzes, that you're having some kind of problems, I'm not necessarily available to help. And I mean, it's not the end of the world if you just don't turn in the quiz and you tell me Monday, well, I was having trouble and I couldn't get in touch with you. These things happen, but ideally you will have attempted the quizzes by the end of the workday Friday. So if you have trouble, you can get in touch with me. And that's all I wanted to say before I cut you loose. Have a great day, and I'll see you on Monday. Well, I guess I also wanted you to say that if you just don't do the quizzes, I'm going to be sending an email, well, filling out a form saying this student isn't doing any work in my class, and you might run into financial aid problems. So please attempt the quizzes. I mean, always, but especially now. Now you really can go. I'll be home at that time.